but joining me right now is Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger of Illinois. He sits on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Congressman, thanks for coming in. You bet. Yeah, thanks for having me. What an amazing morning this has been. Um, President Trump, your reaction to President Trump's letter? I think it was the right thing to do, and I, actually I think what's interesting about it is it's not a letter where it comes back in like to what the messaging that's been out of North Korea, no name calling, is just like, look, this is bad for the country, or bad for the world, but we're also not going to negotiate under these circumstances. To paraphrase, if you want to come back to the table, give us a call. We'll come back to the table with you, but we're not going to be threatened, and we're not going to do it under... I think it actually shows a position of strength, and frankly, it is to ki the Kim regime's advantage to meet with the president and negotiate. I'm not predicting this, but I would not be surprised if they come back and try to keep this meeting on, or at least reschedule for the near term. All right, well, we, we will see, but part of... The right. What the president writes in the letter is that he's canceling the meeting based on the tremendous anger and open hostility displayed in your most recent statement. That, of course, is a statement where a North Korean official called Vice President Pence stupid. Um, is that a stupid dummy? Is a stupid political dummy or something, something right. like that? Yeah. Is that is that a good enough reason to cancel the summit when we've been talking about how historic this meeting is and how important this issue is to the world? I think it is. I think it's not. It's not just that. It may not be a new in the letter, but it also yeah. is the fact that North Korea has been saying they're not going to denuclearize, they're not going to go by these, you know, preconditions that we've set out. So again, I think the president didn't come in and say, we hate you, we're not going to ever talk to you. But the president basically said, look, your language is not the type of thing that we're going to go negotiate with. We're the United States of America. We do have the ability to call shots that North Korea doesn't. That's the, one of the advantages of being us. And we're not going to negotiate under these circumstances. If you want to, and you want to come in good faith, Let's do that. But until then, you know, we're just not going to we're not going to subject ourselves to this. But that was one of the criticisms kind of going into this is that the Trump administration really didn't work out any preconditions ahead of the meeting. So do you think this was doomed from the start? No, I think they I think there were preconditions worked out to an extent. Look, we have three hostages that Mike Pompeo helped to negotiate the release of without really any payment on our end. And then you look at the fact that leading up to June 12th, They've been talking about, well, we're, we're going to go in with this thing that North Korea is going to have to completely denuclearize. North Korea said, well, we're not going to do that. And then they start name calling and now we're walking away. So I think preconditions were actually in progress by the staff level or other channels. And we've said those preconditions aren't being met. One of those is you can't call the vice president a stupid dummy, among other things. <laughs> well, they have a way with words. Um, do you do you think this is the final word? No. Do you think um, it could? I mean, I ask that because these are two men with big egos and, and on display for the world to watch this play out. On some level, I do wonder how they can reopen talks after this. Well, North Korea came to the table initially or said they were willing to come to the table because sanctions were hurting, because their commerce has been, had been hurt significantly, because the world was rallying against them. That pressure hasn't alleviated, so we can go back to bringing that pressure on them, and eventually they will be compelled to do it. And if they don't, again, it's a decision that the regime is going to make that is not going to benefit them or the world. But I do think if, if the president would have said, well, we're going to keep this summit on, no matter what you're saying, we, we, we desperately want to meet with you and fix this problem, then you'd be walking in from a position of weakness, and that would be sending the message that we're desperate for a deal. We're, we want a deal. We want the right deal, though, that's going to lead to peace for the next generations. Um, is the world more dangerous today after the summit's now been called off? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I think... No, because nothing has changed from where we were. Now, if Kim Jong-un starts racing towards nuclear weapons again, it would be probably about as dangerous as it's been. Uh, the world's got a lot of issues out there, and one of these is this uh, North Korean nuclear thing. And I think coming back to get them to a verifiable infinity, never ever nuclear weapons ever again, um, with some conditions on our end, some gives, um, I think that'll make the world safer, and I think this is the right way to get to that deal. For this... If we call, call it a setback, call it a hiccup, call it a major obstacle, whatever you want to call it, is do you think the National Security Advisor John Bolton is to blame for this? Because he's the one who first brought up the Libya model with then Donald Trump tried to clean up and then Vice President Pence was asked about, which then led to the statement from the North Koreans. Follow the bouncing no. ball there. 
I don't think so. I think, look, the Kim regime knows what was meant by the Libya model. Everybody really knows, which is he gave up his nuclear weapons. Now, then they jump and say, well, he was deposed. Well, yeah, he was deposed because he was a really terrible person and oppressed his people, and they stabbed him to death in the back of a pickup truck. That's not because he denuclearized. It's because his people hated him and rose up. And so saying the Kim model or saying the Libya model is not saying we're eventually going to overthrow Kim, especially when the president has said we're going to guarantee, in essence, security of the right. regime which is a really big step on our end. So now we've gone from fire and fury to Kim Jong-un is an honorable man to we're out, at least for now. What is the message, Congressman, to the world on how the Trump administration does business? I think the message is welcome to the world where there's a crazy dictator in North Korea that puts out a lot of crazy stuff and then the next day crosses the border to South Korea and has, you know, pony puppy time with the South Korean president. It's all inconsistent. And so the way to actually get to an agreement, there may be some in, what seems to be inconsistent messages on our part, but it's actually us playing diplomacy, which is we can be tough, we can be willing to reach out, and we can walk away when necessary. But is that a strategy, meet your crazy with our crazy? No, it's not our crazy. It's meeting crazy with a changing strategy to say, how do we get you to the table? And if you're not going to come to the table under our conditions, we'll have a different tone. If you're willing to come to the table, we'll have a different tone. That's just international diplomacy. Congressman, great to have you here.